Welcome to my Parsha share this week, Parsha's Devarim. It begins the book of Devarim, the final book of the Chamisha Chumshe Torah. The Torah is divided into five separate books. Devarim is the final book. And we're going to look at a beautiful, quite lengthy, but very important introduction to Sefer Devarim from the Mikdash HaLevi, my grandfather Sefer. It's a remarkable introduction. It's beautiful. It contains such important um, information with regard not just to the content of Devarim, but the Hashkofa, the Weltanschauung, the way that we should relate to the Torah through, and we see it through the book of Devarim, through Sefer Devarim. Moshe. These are the words that Moshe spoke. El Kol Yisrael to the Jewish people, all of them, Be'eva HaYardin, uh, when they uh, reach the banks of the Jordan River. Uh, they're on the other side. They're on the, uh, they're on the east bank of the Jordan River, on the part that we today would refer to as the country of Jordan. That's where they were. Bamidbar in the wilderness, in the desert. Ba'arava, Moil Suf, Bein Paran, Bein Teufel, Velovon, Bechatseras, Vidizov. These are all different geographic um, locations. If you were doing your Google Maps, this is the biblical version of Google Maps, giving you the exact location geographically where you are with all the different uh, names of the places which are surrounding the Jewish people where they were encamped in anticipation of the conquest of the Promised Land. Moshe Rabbeinu is now, as we're going to see, the Mikdash Halevi is going to tell us, is now in the final few weeks of his life, and he wants to address the Jewish people. They're here in preparatory mode. They're getting themselves ready to take over the land of Canaan, the land of their heritage, the land of their inheritance, the land of their legacy, and they're going to take forward the promise of the Yetzias Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, uh, the, uh, the receipt of the Torah when they received it at Mount Sinai. They're 40 years later. They're ready. They've never been more ready. And now Moshe Rabbeinu says, hold on a minute. I've got a few things to tell you. Sefer Devarim Nikra Kiyodua B'Shem Mishnah Torah. What is the name the Chazal give to Sefer Devarim to this final book of the Torah? Mishnah Torah. We're going to see what that means. Mishnah Torah. Shloishim v'shiva yomim lifnei p'tirosai. 37 days before Moshe Rabbeinu died. Five weeks before he passed away. Mazke Moshe Rabbeinu leklal Yisrael es kol ha-mu'urois ha-historiyim she'iru me'oz yitzias mitzrayim. Moshe Rabbeinu goes through all the different events and happenings and occurrences that had taken place since the Yetzirah Mitzrayim, since the Jewish people left Egypt. And what can we learn? What can we derive? What information that is helpful to us, the Jewish people, can we derive, that's what was going on here, from all the events that took place, everything that had happened to us in the period of time between Yetzirah Mitzrayim and Kibush Ha'aretz, when we finally were going to embark on the conquest of the Promised Land. Broadly speaking, we're not going to get into the details. I've given a share on the past, in the past, about exactly what Mishnah Torah means in terms of the details the individual details of which mitzvahs were mentioned, which mitzvahs weren't mentioned. But broadly speaking, Moshe Rabbeinu takes all the mitzvahs in the Torah and repeats them and says them over in a slightly different way for the Bnei Yisrael so that they can hear what are the mitzvahs that they have already received but which now should we, we should go over again so that we can know what it is that we need to observe when we get into Eretz Yisrael. And he goes into all the details of the 613 mitzvahs that were received at Mount Sinai. V'hu af moisif paratim chadoshim. He adds new aspects, new details, new pieces of information with regard to each mitzvah. Shaloi nimsru adayin. Oi, shaloi hisparshu b'meluam. So, 
there are certain mitzvahs that you, you, we receive, but we didn't get every detail of that mitzvah. The learn his parashubim loyam, we didn't, in fact, perhaps explain every aspect in a fulsome way so that we can know exactly what we need to do when it comes to observing that particular mitzvah. It's called Zeus. Koil Moshe Rabbeinu bin Um Oruch. All of these things, Moshe Rabbeinu included in what is referred to here in the Mikdash HaLevi as a Neum Oruch, a very long drosha. In fact, it wasn't one drosha, it was several droshas, but essentially it was one long address. It may have been divided into a number of addresses, part one, part two, part three, part four, etc. But essentially it was one long address, one long drosha that he gave over, over a five-week period. Hamis paris le al kol sefer dvorim. Let's be frank, the whole of sefer dvorim until almost the end, is a drasha that Moshe Rabbeinu gave. It's the text of an address, of a speech that Moshe Rabbeinu gave. And that's what's referred to as Mishneh Torah. Shame Zem, Mishneh Torah. What does it mean? What does the words Mishneh Torah mean? What do we mean when we say that Devarim, the Sefer, Devarim is called Mishneh Torah? It's there to inform us of the two most important aspects, the two elements of this particular book in the Torah. Let's be, let's, let's look at Sefer Dvarim. What is it? It is essentially a repetition of much of the information that was contained in the previous three books of the Torah. Shemois, Vayikra, and Bamidbar. Those were the three books which recall the elements of uh, uh, the information regarding the events that took place that involved the Jewish people after Yetzirah Mitzrayim and then until the five-week period before Moshe Rabbeinu died. You have Shemois, Vayikra, and Bamidbar. Reishis, says the Mikdash HaLevi, Hamatara Hino Shinun, Miloshin Chazora. The first thing we need to know is that there's this word Shinun, Mishneh Shinun. It's there to tell us that it's a repetition. We're going over material that had already been um, talked about, discussed, and included in the text of the Torah. It's a repetition of something that we already know. You know, sometimes you want to go over material, and you go over it again, whatever it is, it's a repetition. It doesn't mean that you didn't know it, it means that you're repeating it. That's the word Mishneh, uh, it contains the words, the letters, Shinun, Shinun means that we are going over material that we had already had. The Ilu Hashniyo Mishneh Miloshen Limud. What's the word Mishneh means? It means actually to learn. It's another word. You know, the Hebrew language is, is a limited language, but the important aspects of the Hebrew language have a number of repetitions or, or parallels in terms of the vocabulary. And here the word Mishnah means to learn. Miloshen limud, kloimar, hasogas amkus noisefes. We're going to learn elements of the Torah that we have we've known in the past, we're going to look at them from a different angle, we're going to understand them with greater depth and with greater knowledge than previously. We know that there is nothing in the Torah that is irrelevant and that is superfluous. Every word of the Torah is calculated. God did not include in the Torah even one letter that is unnecessary and superfluous. And it's certainly true, whatever you're going to say, that he would not have included an entire book in the Torah that was superfluous. Every law, every Jewish law, every aspect of 
the activities that are recorded here, the Prat and every detail Shahuz group a Sefer Mishnah Torah that is included in the Sefer Dvarim that we call Mishnah Torah, Noi Adu Bechdele Lamdenu Dava Chidush Dvar Chidush, every aspect of Sefer Dvarim is there to tell us something that we didn't know before. It may be, as it were, a repetition. It may be there, and we say, one second, haven't we heard that somewhere before? But nevertheless, it's there to teach us something that we didn't know before, even though it was there. It's there in Shemais. It's there in Vayikra. It's there in Bamidbar. No, no. What was there in Shemais, Vayikra, and Bamidbar is totally different or doesn't include some aspect of what Sefer Devarim, when it includes that aspect or that mitzvah or that piece of information, that piece in Devarim is there to tell us something new. Dvar Chidush. It has a purpose for us. It's there to teach us something that we didn't know before. Kach Ludugma. And the Mikdash Shalevi gives an example. There's a pasuk in Dvarim, Dvarim Yudalad, pasuk Chof Aleph, tells us we're not allowed to cook the meat of a kid in its mother's milk. That means if there is a kid, a, a baby goat that is born, you're not allowed to take that meat and cook it, boil it, in the milk of its mother. We know all the dinim of Bosa v'cholov are based on the posuk le'sevashel g'di b'chalevi mai. Ka'shezu l'masa ha'pam ha'shlishis bahu muzkor. Says the Mikdash Halevi that this posuk of le'sevashel g'di b'chalevi mai, which is there to teach us about the dinim of Bosa v'cholov, of dairy not being able to mix with meat products and that we have to keep a separate kitchen and that dairy and meat have to be kept completely separately. It's in fact the third time this posuk is mentioned. Bamabat shitchi, superficially, if you're looking at the Torah, you might think, one second, you, didn't you already say that? Didn't we already have the posuk place of Asher Gedi Bechalev in May? Why are we having it again? You might think, oh, one second, it's not necessary. It seems superfluous. It's not, it's not something that we needed to know because we knew it already. Asher Matarasa Enon Ela Shinon. So why do we have it? You might think to yourself, okay, it's good to do Chazorah. It's good to repeat things so that we know them better. And that's why the Posuk of Leisav Asher Gedi Bechalev Imoy appears in Sefer Devarim for the third time. Ulam. Iyun Bedivrei Rabbi Seinu Gemar. If you look at Chazal, the Gemar in Kedushin Tafnun Nun Zayin Amad Beis, Melamed, Ki Kol Ez Koyer Noisav Shel Adin Moisiv Prat Mesuyim Asher Toyim Es Trumosoy Lavonas HaMitzvah Ba'ife Meduyek Umakif. Every time the Torah mentions, this is the Gemara in Kiddushin, every time that we have the Posuk Le'sevashel G'di B'chalei V'moi, it teaches us something new about the dairy-meat separation. We have halochas. You're not allowed to uh, mix meat and milk. You're not allowed to mix meat products with milk products, dairy products. Each one of the psukim, says the Gemara in Kedush, I'm going to go over it now, teaches us a separate halacha in relation to the separation of meat and dairy products. So the posuk that appears in Devarim, as Chazal explained it to us, is not there simply to repeat something that we already knew, but we're just saying it again to remind us of something that we already knew. It's there to teach us something new. It's there to teach us something that we didn't know before. And that's what's so important about Devorim. It's Mishneh Torah. It's teaching us something that we thought we knew, but we didn't know quite as well or in quite as much detail as we need to. And therefore, Mishneh Torah is there to give us that extra information. Kamoikein. Moitim anu b'parshas Devorim. Hapoiseches a Sefer Mishnah Torah, in the, in the parasha of Dvarim, not the Sefer Dvarim, the first portion 
of Sev Devarim is referred to as Devarim, we see something A few weeks ago we had Parsha Shlach that tells us the story of the spies that were sent by Moshe Rabbeinu into the Promised Land to spy out the land and to give information, to scout out what would need to be done in terms of the military conquest that they were about to embark upon. He sent them uh, um, and, uh, you know, it was... It, was, it took place right at the beginning of the 40 years, but we just had it a few weeks ago in Sefer Bamidba, Parsha Shlach Lecha. And here in Sefer Devarim, in Parsha Devarim, we repeat it again, the, st- the same story appears. Ulam yesh bay mishum teisefes neifech mashmausis hameira asam hu'urais ba'oy shayna lachalutin. You know, that in Sefer Dvarim, in Parshas Dvarim, when it talks about the story of the Maraglim, we have a significant nugget, something that doesn't appear in the definition, in the description of the story of Shalach Lecha, of the Maraglim in Parsha Shlach, something that adds a whole new element, a whole new dimension to the story that we didn't know before. That's exactly what Dvarim is about as the Mikdash HaLevi is going to explain. If we look superficially at the Sedra of Shalach Lecha, If you look at the words that begin the parasha of Shalach Lecha, what might you think? You might think that the instruction came directly from God. God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Shlach lecho anoshim, send people, send the spies. And you might think superficially, because you don't know much about it. If you look at the psukim, you look at the translation, you would say, okay, Hashem wanted Moshe Rabbeinu to send spies into Eretz Yisrael. Me'uravos urvusai shel Moshe Rabbeinu. The, in terms of the involvement of Moshe, omnam remuza b'milo achas, the only... Um, reference that we have to Moshe Rabbeinu's involvement in terms of this particular incident in the history of the Jewish nation, the only reference we have is the word lecha, shlach lecha anoshim. Hashem said to him, send it for you, for your purposes. And that's the hint that we have that Moshe Rabbeinu was somehow involved, that there's something more going on here behind the scenes. Ulam, lumur v'asam, shal b'nei Yisrael atzman, in terms of the involvement of the Jewish people in the decision to send spies into Eretz Canaan, there's no reference in Parsha Shlach Lecha. You won't hear of it, you won't see it, you won't know about it if you look at Parsha Shlach, because it's not there. However, when it comes to Sefer Dvarim, and here in Parsha Dvarim, Moitzim Anu Lefeta Gilu Chodosh. Suddenly we discover a new revelation. Moshe Rabbeinu describes the events that took place. He describes them as follows. Listen to the, what the Posuk says. It's Posuk, Perik Aleph, Posuk Chofbeis. Vatikruvun Eilai, you drew near to me. Kulchem, all of you. Vatoimru. And you said as follows, Nishlecha anoshim lefoneinu. Send anoshim, send men before us, ahead of us. Ve'yachperu lano es let them spy out, scout out land. Ve'yoshivu isonu dvar dovor. Es haderech ha'shenale bov, es ha'orim ha'she novoy aleim. They will come back to us and they'll give us information about how we should enter into the promised land, what we should do, where we should go, how we should go about going into the land, because obviously we need the information, we need the intelligence to inform us about how we should proceed in the conquest of the promised land. And I heard what you said, and I found favor in my eyes, says Moshe Rabbein to the Jewish people here in Parsha Tzvarim. I actually agreed with you. I thought it was a good idea. And I took from among you 12 people, each one of them a prince in their tribe, and they were the ones that were sent to scout out Eretz Canaan. Kaloima, what are we seeing here? What does this posuk 
in Parshas Devarim tell us that we didn't already know. You know what we're finding out here for the very first time? We're discovering that the fact that spies were sent into the Promised Land was an idea that was concocted, that was um, produced by the Jewish nation. It wasn't something that came as a directive from God. It wasn't something that Moshe Rabbeinu decided you want to do and he sought God's counsel and God said to him, it sounds like a good idea. This was something that emerged and emanated from the people themselves. It was totally about them. What does that mean? That the Jewish nation were the ones who sent the Meraglim. They were the ones who wanted the Meraglim to go. And Moshe Rabbeinu responded to their request by sending the Meraglim. Now we suddenly see the events that took place with the Meraglim from a different angle completely. The important messages, the the fundamental messages that are contained in this story that we need to derive from it, they get a completely new face. They are seen in a totally different light. The fifth book of the Torah that's called Devarim that's known to us as Mishnah Torah, the reason it exists as one of the Chamisha Chumshit Torah is not because it's required for repetition, nor is it because we need to learn its content in and of, them, in and of itself. It's there to teach us something. We need to learn something. It's Mishneh Torah. We need to learn something from it. Its intent is to teach us to clarify for us points that require clarification. To sharpen for us aspects of the narrative which were not sharp enough for us in terms of our knowledge of them in information that we have already seen previously. And to present to us both the events and the laws in the full and maximum level of detail and clarification. That is the purpose of Mishnah Torah. Elo shekan mis oireres lich oira kushyo atzuma. On the basis of everything that we have just said, it generates for us a great and important and a fundamental question. Kulum lo yoise poshut oya lichto vesapratim alolu kulom kvami lichat chilo. Surely we could have written all these details previously when the aspects of whatever it is that's mentioned in Devarim, were mentioned previously in Shemois, Vayikram Bamidbar. Why didn't you just include those details there? Why are they being put here in Sefer Devarim? Why are they separated from the source text, from the original source of information regarding these aspects of the Torah and the mitzvahs? It would spare us from having to look Again, um, to repeat information that we already knew, if that information was all contained in the original source, wherever it appeared for the first time, we wouldn't have to go over it again. Who cares? Why do we need to go over it again? Wouldn't it have been much better, much more sensible? Wouldn't it have made much more sense for whatever it is that's contained in Sefer Devarim to have been mentioned whenever the events took place or whenever the mitzvah was given previously. So each mitzvah is contained in one place. Why does it need to be repeated 
And why repeat it in a book that's somehow separate, even though it's part of the Torah, it's at the end of the Torah, it's a new book, and suddenly you're repeating a whole bunch of things that were previously discussed. It wouldn't it be better to have everything that we need about a particular subject in one place rather than put it in multiple places in various sources within the Torah. If you think about it, this particular question is not unique to Sefer Devarim. It's something actually that if you think about it more carefully and go into it more deeply, you'll see that it is a question that affects much more than Sefer Devarim. Gamba Torah Baal Peh, the Gemara of Mishnah. Have you ever learned a Gemara? you'll see that there's a lot of information in different Mishnais that refer back to things that you've learnt elsewhere in another Masechta. You've got the same sugya in one Masechta that's with reference to the original source information in another Masechta. And you see that all of those things that were mentioned elsewhere are somehow mentioned in another place. There's a second and sometimes a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth place where exactly the same information is discussed, described, gone over, picked over by sometimes and very often the same Tanoim, the same Amoraim. Why would you do that? It seems so disorganized. Why would you do that? The Chalokim Shonim Shalashas in different places in the Shas, in the Talmud, you see the same information. Surely it would be, make much more sense to organize it in such a way that it's subject matter indexed. V'shuv oila tamia. And now we, once again we have the question. Madu aloi merukozois kol halochois anog ois lenois emesuyim. Why isn't it that we have all those subjects that refer to a particular subject matter? particular topic, in one particular place you know that if you open Meseches Psochim, everything in, with relation to Pesach is going to be mentioned in Meseches Psochim. But actually what you'll discover that in Meseches Psochim we talk about Pesach and then somehow in another Mesech we also talk about Pesach. good example is Gemara Brochus and Gemara Megillah. Gemara Brochus, you have a lot of discussion about Tfilois and what goes on in Davening, Laning, all different aspects of the praying experience are mentioned in Maseches Brochus. Suddenly, when you learn Maseches Megillah, you'll discover actually a lot of that information is repeated and discussed in Maseches Megillah. Why have it in two places? Surely all the material that is in Maseches Megillah could quite happily be put into and inserted into the same discussion that occurs in Maseches Barachos. Why would you say it twice? Why would we tire out? Why would we famata? That's a Yiddish word. Why would we... Uh, take it out of the person who wants to study Torah through the Talmud so that when he studies a particular topic he has to have multiple books open in front of him in order to make sure that all the information with regard to the particular topic that he is studying currently all that information is available to him because it's in multiple sources. Why would that have been the case? Why would anyone have done that? If somebody wants to get to the very bottom of halacha of any particular topic that is raised in Shas, they've got to have open in front of them every place in the Talmud where that topic is mentioned. Why would that be the case? It seems a waste of energy. If you get down to the essence of the matter, let's see what it is. Nire Shachuva you're going to see that the answer is very simple indeed. God wants to teach us a very important lesson. Whether it's Torah, the Torah itself, 
that we have the five books of Moses, Chamisha Chum or whether it's Torah Shabbal Peh, which is the Talmud, Kia Torah Kulay Namiksha Achas. Everything about the Torah is one united and combined piece. Yechida Shalema Bilti Noisenes Lachaluka. It's a complete object that cannot be divided into separate sections. Everything about it is complete. Every part of it relates to every other part. The entire Torah, whether we're talking about the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, whether we're talking about the six volumes, the six, um, the six tractates, of the Mishnah is called Divrei Hatanoim Vamaroim, or the Gemara that explains all of those Mishnahs. Kulam Mahavim Me'arag Echod Shalem. Each and every one of them may seem like separate entities, but they all form one thing. They are all cut from one piece of cloth. They are complete. Every single thread of that cloth, whether it's a particular duff, in Bavli, or whether it's a particular pasuk in the Torah, each one of those threads, it cannot stand on its own. It will never be successful in and of itself. The only way it can survive, the only way that it can have meaning, is if it's a part of the greater whole. It's one part of the whole sum. That's what the Torah is. The Torah is not dividable. Because you've got a section that deals with this and a section that deals with that. Every part of the Torah comes together as one great whole. From this, we, uh, let's, let's get serious. What is the Torah? The Torah is an entity that is indivisible, that is complete. And not only that, it's... It's something, each aspect of it relates to every other aspect. Let's, let's look at um, one of the rules, the hermeneutic rules that we have to derive mitzvahs in the Torah is kalvachomer. It's a logical device, a fortiori. That's what it's called. You can Google it. It means that if you have something of a lesser stringency, and something of a greater stringency, or something weak and something strong, that whatever it is that applies to the weak will certainly apply to the strong. Why is that? Because if it applies to the weak, and therefore it's relevant to that which is weaker, that which is um, less intense than that which is more intense, it will certainly apply to. That's the a fortiori argument, the Kalva Chomer argument. Similarly, you have something called a Gezer shava. You have something which is, you take a word or phrase from one place in the Torah, which refers to whatever that particular section of the Torah is discussing, and you use that phrase to teach you something in a totally different chapter in the Torah, which has no um, relationship whatsoever with the actual topic that's being discussed in the first location. What is the purpose of a Gzeir Shoveh? What is the purpose of a Kalva Chaimeh? It's that we can use different aspects of the Torah as a platform to teach us new information about other aspects of the Torah. From one topic to another. Mitchum letchum, from one domain to another. Afilu kasha in keshe yoshir ben shnei atchumim. Even if there's no direct connection between these two topics, between these two domains, between these two issues, we can still use the Kalva Chaymer and we can still use the Gzeir Shaveh. What is that teaching us? Says the Mikdash Alevi. V'shuv ha meser ha'imed ma'achrei hadvarim ha'inu. Let's see what it is. What's the message here that the Torah wants to teach us? Ki Torah mahava miksha achas. The Torah is one. Everything in the Torah is related to everything else. The asher kol prat mitoycha choylek es mashem usay rechava hahekif. Every detail within the Torah is there to teach you something which is in the broadest possible way. In Protim Rabim Acherim, 
and it will teach you new details about whatever the broad topic is that you're going to relate it to. Even when the topic at hand that's being discussed that you're using to teach you something else or something new about another topic has absolutely no relationship, there's no direct connection, and there's, they don't seem to be connected in any way. Me'ata. If you want to, you can say as follows. What is the most important lesson that we can derive from the final book of the Torah, Sefer Dvarim, Sefer Mishnah Torah? It's specifically about this Nakuda, this aspect, this piece of information. Shel Achtus HaTorah Ushalei Musa. The unity of the Torah as a particular body of work and its completeness. Whether it's Torah Shabbat or Torah Shabbat Peh, the Torah has an achdus to it. There's a unity contained therein that brings everything together, even things which seem unrelated are somehow related simply because they are in this body of work known as the Torah. The Torah is deliberately written in this seemingly disparate, disconnected way. Why? To teach us and to reveal to us a very important inform- a piece of information that the Torah is indivisible. There's no aspect of the Torah that can be divided and separated from any other aspect. Says the Mikdash Alevi, for this, in this way, by knowing what Dvarim, what Dvarim represents, we have a powerful answer to those within Reform Judaism or liberal branches of the Jewish faith who claim that some parts of the Torah are relevant but others are Aunt, we have a perfect answer for them, which dismisses their thesis completely. What is it? What is it that they want to do? The reform, the conservative movement, reconstructionist, or people who love the Torah because it's got certain moral codes and moral messages, but don't like other aspects of the Torah because it doesn't fit in with the way they see the world, they'll say, you know what, the section of the Torah we like will adopt and we revere and we respect, and we will hold by. But the other aspects of the Torah, well, they're not relevant to us, and therefore we don't have to observe them. That point of view is completely undone by the existence of Sefer Devarim. No one can ever say that any one part of the Torah can be separated out from, any, from the rest of the Torah, from any other part of the Torah. Why? Because it's all one unified piece of work. And that's what Devorim is there to teach us. <laughs> to this idea, there is absolutely no place in Judaism for it. We've just learnt, and what we've just discussed, proves to us beyond any doubt there's absolutely no discussion worth having about it that every aspect of the Torah is connected to every other aspect of the Torah and when Mishnah Torah repeats something it's not repeating it because it wants to repeat it it's repeating it because it wants to connect every aspect of the Torah to every other aspect of the Torah so you treat every word and letter of the Torah with equal Reverence. This piece of cloth, this beautiful piece of cloth you see, you can't say that any thread within it is not relevant. If you remove one thread, that piece of cloth no longer exists. It doesn't have that same power. The Torah, take one letter, and certainly if you take a word or a verse or a chapter out and say that that chapter is no longer relevant, essentially what you are saying is that the Torah is no longer relevant. It's all one body of work and no aspect of it can be taken out and that's what Sefer Devarim teaches us. The Agav, 
הרעיון האומו, המדגש השלימוס התורה ואס היוסה, יחידו אחס בלתי ניתנס לחלוקה. The fact that we have just proven beyond any doubt that the Torah is one unified book of work that doesn't lend itself to any kind of division or any aspect of it to be removed, excised. What does it tell us? This, this idea tells us something important. Omad me'achrei hisrachshu yois historios mas irois lepnei meos shonim. This is what stands behind underpins, underscores the controversial historical occurrences that happened hundreds of years ago. It's not necessarily in the Torah, but that which we have just learned can teach us something about an aspect of our Jewish history, which I've discussed before, but which I'm going to repeat to you now, which is so important to hear, because this is such a beautiful idea, and it totally reconciles every aspect of the story that I'm about to relate. Hoya ze kasher abein horamba. Maimonides. What did Maimonides do? Lived in an age where, sadly enough, ignorance of Torah study, ignorance of Torah law, was rife and rampant throughout the Jewish world. Hishlim es chibura hanoida yada chazoka. And he wrote something, it's a 14-volume work, which is the yada chazoka, he went through the entire Talmud and rewrote it in a way, in a sense, in such a way that it presents us with an organized format for halacha. He took the Torah Shabbat and the Torah Shabbat and organized it for us in such a way that we can just open a book and know the halacha, we know where to find it, and we know what the Rambam says, we can understand it, it's in written in a beautiful Hebrew. That's what he did, the Yad HaChazokah. What was the purpose? Why did he do it? He wanted to make it easier for somebody who's studying halacha to be able to do so without referring to the very complex and dense material that is contained in Talmud Bavli, which was the source of halacha. He can find the conclusion of all the halachic discussions in a psak din that contained the Mishnah Torah. That was his purpose, is to take the entire Torah, Shabich Tzav and Shabal Peh, specifically Baal Peh, the oral law, and turn it into a usable law book, not a, a jumble of information, which is what Talmud Bavli is. Mibli lehis yagea belisparish apne sugi es rabbis hashas. He didn't want to use uh, Mishnah Torah as a way of expressing his brilliance, of demonstrating and articulating what a fabulous Talmud Chacham he was, his only purpose in writing Mishnah Torah was so that the ordinary bloke, the ordinary fellow, should have access to the conclusions that are drawn after all the discussions in the Gemara, and that they should know what it is that they need to do in any given situation. That's what the Rambam did. Elo Shekan, his oira, his nagdus charifa. I've spoken about it in the past. You can look at my lecture online about the Rambam. The Rambam suffered great insults and denigrations because of the fact that he published the Yad HaChazoka. The fact that he changed the mode of delivery of the information that's contained in the Gemara to a law book, which is simply something that you learn and can learn Kaseder. It's very easy to learn a peric of Rambam every day, even though you don't have to understand it in its depth, but it gives you the halacha. This is what you do on Shabbos. This is what you do on Yom Tov. This is how you daven. This is how you conduct yourself in a court, a courtroom situation. This is how you conduct yourself in your intimate relations, etc. Everything is covered. Every aspect of the Jewish experience from a Talmudic perspective, is covered in the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, and yet he met with great opposition and great antipathy towards the publication. His oirara, his nagdus charifa lechibur, mitzidom shegudoy lehador shechoshishu kilamroi sakavon ha'toiva. What was their cheshbon here? What were they thinking? Why were the people who were opposed to Mishnah Torah so opposed to it, because even though they understood that the Rambam had the best of possible intentions, the fact is 
that studying Mishnah Torah may have resulted, might have resulted, in a reduction of interest in the study of Gomorrah. After all, the Rambam himself says in the introduction to Mishnah Torah, if you've never looked at it, I encourage you to look at it. It's a fascinating document in and of itself. But one of the things he says is that from now on, all you need on your bookshelf, and of course in an age where all books were handwritten, all you need on a bookshelf is Siddur or whatever books you need for prayer. You need a Chumish and you need... Um, you need to have the Mishnah Torah. You don't need a Shas Bavli. You don't need any Talmud on your shelf. What you need is a Chumish, a Tanakh actually, Torah Nevi'im Kesuvim, all the sources of information that are contained in the Torah, in the Prophets and in the writings. And my Mishnah Torah, that is sufficient. You don't need a Talmud. That's what he said. So, what was his idea? So they were concerned that as a result of people getting obtaining the Mishnah Torah, no one's going to look at uh, Gemara anymore, and therefore Gemara is going to disappear. And they were very frightened of that. And therefore they opposed the Rambam. So why? The fact is that the Mishnah Torah was a condensed form a format that contained all the halachas relevant to Jewish life, as a result of which you could come to ignore any other aspect of the Talmud, and all of the Talmud is important, said the, those who oppose the Rambam, the fact that you've created Mishnah Torah is going to cause a reduction of knowledge, not an increase in knowledge. It was a discussion, it was a debate. The Rambam came down on one side of the debate and wrote Mishnah Torah, and those who opposed him came out down on the other side of the topic. Okay. Says the Migdash Alevi. We still, we need to mention that the end of it all, after all was said and done, and the opposition to the Rambam had reached its crescendo, and that in fact Vina public burning in Paris of Mishnah Torah because it was, uh, in, uh, the authorities were informed it's a heretical book and they burnt the Rambams in the street. Book burnings. Rabbeinu Yoyna Migirondi, he was at the forefront of the opposition movement against the Rambam says the Mikdash Alevi, at the end of it all, Afilu Rabbeinu Yoyna, even Rabbeinu Yoyna, Shahoyo Meiroshe HaMisnagdim Lechiburay Shal Rambam. He was front and center, belonging to the opposition, in terms of whether or not we should have Rambam, he was determined to eradicate the Yad HaChazoka, and to make sure nobody ever looked at it. He was the principal enemy of the Yad HaChazaka, of the Rambam. Rabbeini Yoyna himself. Chazar boy, v'nodad mi mokoim l'mokoim k'dei l'lameid sanegoria ala nesher ha-godoyl. Rabbeini Yoyna spent his last few years wondering from town to town and from city to city and even from village to village to act as a public advocate for the Rambam. He was so ashamed of his behavior. He was so disgusted in himself that he would have opposed a God of Israel, the Rambam himself. And he knew he had to make amends. And the way he did it was he went from community to community to tell them that he'd been wrong. He actually wanted to go to Israel and visit the graveside of the Rambam to apologize. It didn't happen. It seems to have been impossible for him to do that. It wasn't as simple as buying a ticket online and boarding a plane and landing at Ben Gurion Airport. In those days, it was very tough to travel to Eretz Yisrael. He tried and it didn't work. 
He actually died before he was able to see his project, to see his plan to full fruition. And he wasn't able to visit Eretz Yisrael. He was never able to ask for Mechila from the Rambam for the opposition that had resulted in this terrible occurrence where the Rambam's books were burnt. If we want to descend, as it were, into the depths, if we want to really get into the kishkas of this matter, we could somehow present it in the following way. Each and every mitzvah of the Torah is an independent entity, in a sense completely unconnected to any other mitzvah. In a material sense, for example, when you put on tzitzis, it's got nothing to do with whether or not you put on tefillin. I'm putting on tzitzis now, say a bracha on a talis, I'm putting on tefillin. Or if I keep Shabbos, it's got nothing to do with keeping Yom Tov. I can keep Shabbos beautifully, and when it comes to Yom Tov, I don't observe Sh- Yom Tov. Does that mean that my Shabbos wasn't kept? Not at all. I kept Shabbos. Does that mean because I kept Shabbos that I don't need to keep Yom Tov? Of course not. You still need to keep Yom Tov when it gets to Yom Tov. One is unrelated to the other. In a material, practical sense, no mitzvah, as it were, is related to any other. Ulam biyasoida oimed shoresh ruchani. At the source, at the root of every mitzvah, there is a spiritual element to it. Shehu hamashutuf lechala mitzvah is kulan. That spiritual core, the essence of the mitzvah, that spiritual, connects the mitzvah that you have observed to every other mitzvah in the Torah. If you kept Shabbos properly, then the essence of that mitzvah, of keeping Shabbos, connects to Yom Tov, even though it's not Yom Tov today. But when you keep Yom Tov, that will have connected back to Shabbos. It connects to Tfilin, it connects to Talas, it connects to Taras HaMishpocha, it connects to every mitzvah that you keep and observe. Every one is connected to every other, not in a practical sense, because when I eat kosher food, it's got nothing to do with observing Shabbos. But in an essence sense, in a spiritual sense, every mitzvah is connected, the baseline is connected to every other mitzvah. Our duty is to make sure that we understand this that the essence of every mitzvah is connected to the essence of every other. And we must make sure that when we observe mitzvahs, that we're not dividing them and saying, you know, this mitzvah I like. I'm going to keep this mitzvah I like. I quite like giving tzedakah. I don't like keeping Shabbos, but who cares? I mean, one, yeah, I'm keeping this mitzvah. What do I need to keep that mitzvah for? No, no. Every mitzvah is connected to every other. When you give tzedakah, it enhances your Shabbos. And when you keep Shabbos, it enhances your tzedakah. Even though they don't seem connected in any way, there is at their root, at their source, the essence, there is a connection between tzedakah and Shabbos and Shoifa and Sukkah and Kashrus and Taras and Mishpocha and every other aspect. And every other mitzvah in the Torah, we just kept Shmita this year. You want to keep Shmita? Connects to Shabbos. Okay, well, there is some connection. It's the seventh year and Shabbos is the seventh day. But still, it's a totally different mitzvah. One's got to do with farming and agriculture. One's got to do with having a day of rest once a week. At their source, at their essence, they are connected. Every mitzvah is connected. That's the message of Dvarim. Dvarim is there to tell you that there's no mitzvah that appears in Shmois Bamidbar. Vayikram Bamidbar, that's not connected to a mitzvah in Devarim. It may be called Mishneh Torah, but it's not a Mishnah, just a repetition for no purpose, because we know there's no such thing as any words or letters or psukim or chapters in the Torah that are there for nothing. Every mitzvah in the Torah, every word of the Torah, every letter of the Torah, the Vav teaches you something about a mitzvah. It's there for a purpose. A whole book called Mishneh Torah, what's the purpose of it? Says the Mikdash Alevi, the purpose is 
to tell you that no aspect of the Torah is unconnected to any other. And it may seem like a repetition. And in a sense, it's something new that you're being taught when it's mentioned in Devarim. But it's there to tell you about the unity of the whole, that every aspect of the Torah is connected to every other aspect of the Torah. We'll leave it here. Thank you.